uh, I would like to introduce our next speaker for the session keynote presentation. Ricky Watts, Senior Director, Industrial Solutions, Wind River. His responsibilities include product strategy and deliverables for the on-premise cloud platform offering within the Wind River Titanium Cloud portfolio. Prior to joining Wind River, he was CTO of Aircom International, a leading supplier of operation and maintenance products for the wireless infrastructure market. Ricky has a business and technology education council, BTEC, diploma in electronics engineering from Reading College, UK. Please welcome him on the stage. Thank you. Didn't realize I was getting so old. Okay, oh great, there are slides there. Oh, very happy to be here today, um, representing Wind River. Um, very happy to be part of the ARC. This is my third event this year for ARC. I was at Orlando, and a few weeks ago I was in Barcelona. Great to be back in India. Um, I'll talk a little bit today around some of the things that we're doing inside Wind River. I'm going to talk a little bit about something called fluid compute. Um, hopefully a few of you are very aware of Wind River. We've been in the industrial market for many, many years, uh, embedded real-time systems. So we have a specific way of looking at this transformation. I was just speaking to some colleagues uh, over break there as well, and it's very interesting in this industry. We talked a lot about all the transformations coming, and I'm going to cover some of those aspects. But ultimately, we've got to remember we're in an industry or in the market in many of the things that we do where we have to be very cautious about those changes. You know, as we make those changes, you know, we can't afford to go backwards. We can't afford to, to lose productivity. We can't afford to lose output. So really, I'm going to cover some aspects about that, what we're doing, how we see those transformations coming in, how we see some of those collisions. And, and as I say, then go into this concept of fluid computing, which I think is a very interesting concept. To the presentation. So Wind River is very much focused in what I would call critical infrastructure areas. Um, operational technologies. It was mentioned this morning, Sal mentioned, I think, in the keynote presentation about OT and IT, and we see a lot of that going on in this market. But Wind River is very much focused around these, what do we call critical infrastructure, OT market. And these are the some of the segments that we, uh, that we provide services and solutions in today. So as you can see, we're already in the energy sector. Um, most of the planes that you see that run around are uh, in many cases running Wind River software that's running those things. And again, if you think about that from the perspective that we look at it, we look at the way our software needs to be deployed and the way that we need to use, it's got to be in areas where things cannot fail. So for example, if we're in the energy sector, the last thing you want is applying new software or new capability and someone turns on the socket and it doesn't, no power comes out. So very much focused around these OT and these critical infrastructure areas. Now, again, a bit repetitive in terms of probably what you're hearing, but you know, there's a couple of things that are going on, I think, that are key in terms of uh, this transformation, you know, this, this uh, period of time that we're going through in terms of industrial. So if we look at it from a, a, you know, a legacy perspective, again, these legacy systems have been around many, many years. Some of them are 20 years old, and I, you know, I've been out to a few plants and seen some of these things working. I mean, they're quite old now. They're reaching what we would call end of their, uh, their, their life cycle. They're getting costly to maintain. They're relatively inflexible. So there's a requirement around this infrastructure that needs to be updated and modified. And yet at the same time, of course, we've got cloud-based technologies, this software-defined autonomous world. I mean, probably everybody's aware of the autonomous industry in, in cars and the I suppose the innovation that's going on there and the direction that's coming on there, everybody's looking for that and how fast that's going to come in. Particularly for me, I live in the Phoenix area um, and the, the autonomous car industry by Waymo or Google is really growing in popularity around there and they're going to be launching a service later this year where you actually can go into a vehicle and drive in a, a you know, nobody in the front seat and the car will take you around the, uh, the, the Phoenix area to wherever you want to go. So you've got this autonomous wave coming in, you've got cloud coming in, you've got the reflection of what's happening in terms of the, own, the, the products that are out there at the moment. But again, I stress, you know, this industry, it, it moves at the pace it needs to move at to obviously appreciate these things. I mean, 
you know, if I look at these life cycle, I had a customer come up to me a few weeks ago and said, hey, I've been operating this piece of software for 25 years. It's performing a very valuable function in my plant. I'm now running out of, I can't run this anymore. The hardware that it's running on has become end of life. What can you do about it? I, I don't want to change the software. I want, I want to rerun it for another 25 years. Can you take this out and can you put it into a newer technology that allows me to take this legacy asset and still move it forward? Again, so again, you've got this collision between the past and the present and how can you balance that between the two? And if you look at it from a compute perspective, you know, we talked about cloud, but let's go back a little bit. Uh, many years ago, we started off with the concept of mainframe right back in the, uh, in the 70s, 80s. And then we went to this client-server architecture where we started moving compute back out to the edge. And now, of course, with cloud, the rise of the Amazon, the Microsofts of the world, the Googles of the world, we're seeing, again, moving back to this elastic compute, this uh, infinite compute that's going back in the cloud. But where are things going to go next? You know, there's been a lot of talk around moving things back to the edge. And I do believe that that is something that is growing. Fog computing is a term I'm sure many of you are familiar with, which is taking the cloud concept and bringing it out to the edge so that you can actually use compute at the edge of the network. But I've got cloud, I've got fog, I've got devices, and then I've got specific things that I need to do within this compute environment. And the reality is, rather than saying it's going to go back to edge computing or there's going to be cloud computing, what we're really looking is the ability to use compute wherever it exists. So whether it exists in the cloud, whether it exists in the fog layer, whether it exists right down at the device level. These devices are compute devices. How can I manage that? How can I manage what I want to do with inside my infrastructure, with inside my factory, with inside whatever I'm doing? How can I manage the compute and, and provide the assets where they need to be running to based on their capability? And we call that fluid compute, the ability to move north and south as well as east and west. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on that later. So OT, IT. You know, if we talk about IT, OT and IT, we've, we've very much seen the, the rapid innovation in the IT market. But IT, in my mind, is really about connecting people and services to the cloud at a very high level. You know, you're really connecting, hey, a mobile device. I, I switch it on, I do a session. If I'm somewhere out there and I'm running at a remote place, I might be doing you know, Office or Word or something. It's about services you get from the cloud that are connecting people. Ultimately, at the end of the day, if there's an interruption or something goes wrong in that, yeah, maybe I have to wait two seconds before something appears on my phone or my device. It's not critical. It's not something that is going to cause huge amounts of impact to me. Ah, personally, I might be a little bit fed up, but nothing's going to break. But the OT environment is very different. When you're talking about devices and things that are being connected to do processes and do things, that is something that's not acceptable. If something has to run at a very, very stringent time requirement, it has to run. So albeit we're seeing an OT and IT convergence, absolutely, at the edge of the network, we can't lose sight of the fact that OT is going to continue to exist. The world isn't going to become IT at the edge of the network. IT doesn't solve safety problems. It doesn't solve all your security problems. It doesn't solve all your time problems. It doesn't solve all your regulation problems. So yeah, I want to bring in cloud capability. I want to bring in what's best from IT, but I can't lose sight of OT. If I lose sight of OT, I'm actually going to go backwards. And that's not something that we want to do as we go forwards. So expanding that out in terms of what am I looking at? You know, you see the picture here. We've got some specific capabilities where you've got cloud on the, on the right hand side. We're all very familiar with cloud. If you put stuff into the cloud, it's infinite compute, very scalable, very accessible, depending on what changes the business models. I talked a little bit about fog where we're bringing cloud capability down towards the edge of the network. But we've got to appreciate, if you're going to bring something out of the cloud and bring cloud-level compute to the edge, how are you going to do that? How are you going to appreciate the OT and the IT characteristics? Because if I move, start to go into the left, right down to the safety perspective, safety is something that is very, very, um, I would say, it's something that you cannot afford to mess around with. Safety systems have to work. They have to be isolated. They have to be appreciated. If something fails on a safety system, it goes back to fail-safe state. 
So again, you've got these capabilities, even when I'm at compute environment, great. Am I going to put a safety system into an IT domain? Absolutely not. But how can I make it part of my compute continuum? So expanding a little bit, those industrial systems, as I mentioned, costly, hard to interoperate. They're purpose-built appliance systems that do specific jobs. And I'm always the first person to say they do them very well. If I want something today, I can get it. If I want power, I get it. Water, I get. I accept that these things are there. So I have to appreciate those systems. But again, they are starting to become difficult to maintain, difficult to allow and to go to this new flexible models. Sal mentioned the idea that uh, you know, instead of mass production, I can, pr I can produce at that rate to individual levels. Well, you can't do that with these legacy systems. But again, the balance is there. But of course, I do want to take in that capability from the cloud, whether it's scalability, agility, you know. And then very important part here as well is, is if you look at compute and the way things are going, it's how do I disaggregate the compute or the hardware capability from the software assets? The world is very much becoming driven by software as we know, but that all runs on hardware, okay? So disaggregating is done in the cloud. It's already done. I mean, you have no idea when you send off applications and services up to a cloud what they're running on. It's running on an IA platform, I'm sure, somewhere, but you have no idea. It doesn't matter. It's disaggregated. So we've got to bring that disaggregation also down, that capability that allows us to be much more flexible on how we deploy those resources. It gives us more capability with te uh, technology such as virtualization. So virtualization and what I would call consolidation towards the edge of the net network. So bringing virtualization down to the edge now. So now what I can do is I can scale applications and services right down at the fog layer, what we call this east-west capability. So you can start to dynamically add more functionality, move things from those legacy appliances from brownfield, soft evolution into the greenfield environment. You can expand upon that. You can put security assets, et cetera, at the edge of the network. But also, we talk about newer technologies such as AI analytics. You know, there are things that are going on at the edge of the network. Where, where, how far do you want to send the data? How far are you allowed to sell, send the data? So I want to be appreciative of that and deploy those assets where they need to be. Some of the data needs to go into the cloud. Some of the data needs to go into the edge. And the analysis of that needs to be done and appreciated from where the compute is. So the concept here is what I'm looking at is rather than be fixated on saying everything goes into the cloud, I can, I can move assets between north and south. Why should there be something that draws a hard line there? It, doesn't, it isn't needed anymore. So getting a little bit more specific now in terms of the, some of the things from a capability that need to be in place as we're looking at this evolution at the edge of the network, three areas I'd like to cover, real time, safety, and security. Security I'll start with. Security is a really interesting one. It's a big challenge for all of us. Great. Everything gets connected. Well, when everything gets connected, that's fantastic because it now allows a lot of flexibility between those apps and services, the data that's available. But it also raises a huge security challenge. You know, the last thing you want is one of your plants being hacked losing production because somebody breaks into the system. And we've all seen many instances recently of viruses, bugs, etc., that have been apparent in these systems. So the more connected you get, the more of a security concern that you have. So in Wind River, when we look at deploying something like this, that is something that is a key characteristic. We've got to create an environment where we can say something is very secure, as secure as it can be. And I look at that in two aspects. Yes, we make sure our software is extremely secure, i.e. we lock it down from top down in terms of access control. We put capability into our platforms that can lock it to the hardware so that you can't deploy software assets and you, unless you have the keys for the hardware. But the last thing is, is security is something that continues to move. It's an ongoing challenge. So you've always got to recognize as much as you think you've made as much of the technology as secure as possible, recognize you don't know what you don't know. So the second part of our security is how fast can we react to something that is perceived as a security threat 
in the network or in the, uh, in the infrastructure layer that we're putting out. So the ability to detect security in near real time and then effectively isolate that application, that service, or that user into an environment where he doesn't or can, we can limit the damage that he can do, or we can shut down the process. Again, creating a security island in the OT domain. Okay? So from our perspective, that's a very important capability that we have to recognize in this new world. If it's not secure, it won't work. It will fail. Safety. I mentioned safety a little bit as well. Safety island, this, island, this concept of safe. So safe systems are usually systems that are isolated from the rest of the, what I would call the plant. They have a fail-safe condition, you know, whether it's power generation, whether it's in the factory, whether it's around robots. It's a safe condition. Those systems must remain in place. Um, the interesting thing is, as we're starting to move forward, we're seeing an ever-changing world in, the, you know, in, in our industries, depending which one you're at. I particularly have been doing some work around robots and the next evolution of robots in factories around cobots, the cooperation between robots and people. And I think uh, Tesla was mentioned this morning. Tesla was a fine example where they went down the entire robot direction and found that the efficiencies of that didn't make as much sense as putting robots with people. Well, that's great. Now I've got robots with people. Now there's some characteristics that change. Safe isn't just a, hey, there's a security fence around the robot, you shan't walk near it. Now I've got to make the software and the hardware safe, and I've got to certify that. Certification comes with huge taxes, as we know from a software perspective. So how can I evolve my, my operational system, my infrastructure layer, to allow this island to coexist with the rest of the infrastructure and still make it part of the interconnected fabric? And then the last, time is, uh, last piece is real time. There are always going to be applications and things that cannot be deployed in the cloud. Time. Even deploying them up to the fog layer, time becomes an issue. So how can I manage time, safety, security, flexibility, all in one type of infrastructure to, to be deployed? Have I got to go and say, hey, I'm going to replace my system with this new interconnected system, but it's going to be another 50 systems? That isn't the answer. So as we build an infrastructure around our capabilities and our embedded base around OT, we're making sure that these islands, these capabilities that are going to be needed for a successful transition to a new type of, of way that we're going to work in these factories must exist. They must be there. So from a real-time perspective, I'm sure many of you are familiar with our VxWorks. VxWorks has been our software stack for the embedded for the real time for many, many years. And again, we've been evolving that. It's actually a business that's growing. It's interesting that software that was developed 30 years ago, and we continue to develop it, of course, is actually growing now. And inside this new paradigm, not everything is going to get shifted to a Linux distribution. You've still got to have operating systems and capabilities that are running at the device or near the device that have this time consistent so that you can have this real-time capability running on that, and then also, of course, look at things like certification. So VX works again, and Linux, around safety. How do I certify something? How do I make sure that I get a, a sign-off? I mean, as I said, mentioned earlier, Wind River's probably in, I would say, I'm gonna guess 90% of the planes in the world. You know, we take it for granted now as people that when we get on a plane, it's very safe. And the reason that it's very safe is the work that's been done by the authorities, by the regulation bodies, is absolutely paramount in terms of all of the systems that run in those environments. And again, we can't lose sight of that. Autonomous vehicles, we all saw recently what happened with, uh, with Uber. They had an accident, and look what happened. They've effectively shut that program down. They probably spent hundreds of millions of dollars, one error, one person obviously got killed, very unfortunate. And it changed the paradigm on everything that everybody was doing. Safety has to be there. So you've got to look at your paradigm as you're starting to shift assets into this new world. If I've got to have a safety characteristic, how am I going to do that? How am I going to certify it? Do I keep it within the compute continuum? Do I, do I take it out and separate it? Do I just leave it as a legacy piece of equipment and don't touch it? So again, you've got, to, you've got to have a solution to these issues as well when we move forward. In Wind River, 
we've been evolving our VX Works and our Linux technology. And uh, actually, in the last few weeks, we delivered a new platform, our VX Works platform. We call it the Converge platform. This is a hypervisor technology based upon VX Works that allows you to do time and space partitioning on a hypervisor. So now I can take those legacy assets or these new assets I want to create and actually create these islands inside this hypervisor. So I can get the advantages of cloud compute by going to a virtualization te technology, but I also can deploy those assets safe, secure, and also real time. Because now I've got a VXWorks hypervisor that can support embedded devices or embedded capability, so I get very, very low latencies. So again, this gives you a capability to look at your legacy devices and allow a transition into cloud compute and extend that out, but not lose sight of the things that I have to do. Let me just click through this. So Titanium Control. Uh, titanium Control is a product that Wind River launched about a year and a half ago. Um, uh, I was involved very much in this. Uh, titanium is a cloud capability. It's a cloud OS, if you would, uh, for want of a word. But this cloud has been engineered to do some very specific things. What we did is we took OpenStack, which is a cloud-based OS that was designed uh, by IBM Rackspace many, many years ago, put together, and we re-engineered that capability. We said, hey, let's take this concept of cloud. Let's take it back. Now, what we want to do is we want to engineer this cloud to be highly available, very, very high performance, very, very low latency. So we want the flexibility of the cloud, but we don't want to lose the certainty in terms of availability and performance. Very important if you consider some of the applications, functions, and workloads. It supports VM, it supports container technology, it doesn't matter. It's a cloud capability, so it's east-west capable. You can do upgrades, downgrades, you can change things, you can have full redundancy, you can scale from a single compute right up to thousands of compute. I had a customer last week that is deploying this on 212 cores for a, a digital twin system. So again, very flexible in terms of the cloud capability, the infrastructure capability. Designed for, for control is designed for the fog layer at the edge of the network. But also within that, you've got the OT paradigm coming through. So if you're putting uh, PLCs, SCADA systems, historians, again, those types of applications and services that exist inside an industrial environment running on legacy appliances, but you want to move to the cloud, we can now move them into this capability around titanium. And then, of course, we can start to link that with our embedded OSs and our converged platform. And really, that is the concept of where we're going inside Wind River and why I think this is really interesting uh, paradigm for us. We're focused on OT. We're focused on things that cannot fail. But we want to bring in modern compute, modern capability that sits on top of that paradigm. So fluid compute to us is a way of doing that. How can we connect these islands that we can connect them in a way that allows you the flexibility of using this decoupled of hardware infrastructure and applications bringing that together, but not losing those paradigms. So here, just an example, you've got functions and services from your plant that exist, maybe exist in Amazon, maybe exists on Microsoft, maybe exists on a private cloud that runs Titanium. It doesn't matter. Those services exist. I have to now deploy them out into the field. So I want to start deploying things. So let's take an example. When I want to deploy a function, it's a PLC. It's running at, what, eight, eight kilohertz. That's very, very time sensitive, down to the microseconds. So I need to deploy that function, that application, as close to the device as possible. Because it's real time, it, it's time dependent. So I can take that through my infrastructure orchestration and deploy that asset right down to where it's being used, right at the edge of the network, okay? So it appreciates OT, it sits in a compute, you've got flexibility, and you're moving based upon that application service to where it's needed. Let's see if this build works now. Okay, try this one. So here I've got another PLC, 
but the, hey, it's a one kilohertz PLC. Technically, I could deploy it right next to the device. Maybe that's okay if the compute's there. Or I could potentially deploy it actually in a fog layer running on titanium control. Now I can use that flexibility of uh, capability I have with titanium control. It's still highly available, high performance, but the time dependency changed the characteristic of that application. So I can deploy it into my fog layer. I can't deploy it into the cloud, won't work. The time doesn't allow it to do that. But I can start to intelligently look at my services and my functions. Where am I going to deploy them? Let's be intelligent. So now I've got this compute pool that, I cap that I've created, and now I can start to put the intelligence in the orchestration and the systems. I can start to simplify things. And then function, it's a, you know, it's an historian. Okay, it's, it's picking up data, it's doing what we call post analysis. Now that could sit at the edge of the network in the fog architecture, it could sit up into the cloud. It doesn't really matter. There's no necessary speak time dependency on it, but there may be a regulation dependency. So again, you can set these dependencies and these capabilities in that policy engine that sits next to the orchestration. So look at your functions. I don't mind if they're AI, analytics, you know, legacy functions, historian, PLCs, it doesn't matter what they are. They are all functions that require some form of compute to run. I then put policies around it and I let the compute decide where things need to run, when and why. And things can change depending on time. You know, some things become more important at different times of the day, become more critical. The interesting thing here is you can start to be very flexibly move around and manage this. And then if I look at this from a north-south perspective, uh, analytics and AI, you know, it's, it, it's really interesting. Um, there are many companies, and some of them were put up earlier in terms of what they're doing. You know, we're not an AI company, but what we're trying to do is put an infrastructure in place to enable AI to perform and do the tasks it wants. AI is gonna become very interesting when AI and analytics start getting connected to control systems. And the AI and the analytics are actually driving control. Now, we're away from that today, but you can start to see that direction coming in. So that AI system also may change. Today it may be an IT-based type of application, but if it gets connected to a direct control system, it becomes an OT requirement. So the ability to flexibly move that. Where am I going to deploy it? Maybe I want to do AI right down at the edge. Maybe I want to do it in the fog layer. Maybe I want to do it in the cloud. Maybe I'm doing it all three as often as not. AI is something that's distributed. It's always about metadata and where things are going. Are you embed processing? And again, the infrastructure that we're putting in place allows that flexibility. You can move applications north-south or you can scale them east and west. So you've got safety, security, certification, reliability, and flexibility in the compute continuum right the way from the cloud, right the way towards the edge of the network. So just wrapping up here, my time is pretty good. So again, I think it's a very interesting paradigm we're going through. Um, you know, the infrastructure that we're building, as I say, around the characteristics that are labeled out there, safe, secure, reliable, and certified. Those, I think, are absolutely critical. You know, control systems, process systems, yes, they are evolving, they are changing, but they're not changing fast. You know, we've got to be doing the right things at the right time and moving them appropriately. You know, there's no such thing as a revolution. here; It's an evolution. So bringing things in such as digital twins that really mimic and, you know, allow us to simulate the factory, connecting the digital twin to the operational part of the network so that now I've got a simulation connected to an operation and I can start to exchange data that can all coexist in the fog or the cloud in this architecture that I'm proposing. But also, if you then start to evolve the concept of digital twin, where digital twin actually becomes a process that's running in the factory, not just a backup or a simulator. If something fails, the digital twin takes over the concept of running the factory. Again, you start to see where you can bring these things together. But these things have characteristics that must be in place, as I say. Safe, secure, reliable, and certified. So again, I hope that was useful. Um, I take a perspective that coming from the cloud I think is really interesting. 
But uh, from our embedded background, we really are trying to give you, you know, uh, capabilities that respect what you're doing today in your factory and allow you to transition into this, uh, this new world in the right way, not losing sight of what you've been doing in the past. So with that, thank you very much.